Thank you. Let me let me start by saying I, you know, I give a lot of presentations to uh, senators, congressmen, White House officials, international dignitaries. So my daughter says, "Daddy, you talk a lot." Um, <laughs> but without question, you guys, this type of audience is my absolute favorite for two reasons. One is. I think what you're doing is extremely noble and underappreciated, so I want to take a second to say thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and, and participate in your nobility, if that doesn't sound too selfish. Um, and the other is I always get more than I give at these kinds of things. I can't say that when I, when I speak to other audiences, but, but without question, I always get more than I give at something like this. And I try and give a lot, so that says something about the, the kinds of things you give to me. So uh, please pepper me with questions, ask me anything you want, about anything you want. I'm, I'm wide open. Um, what I want to talk about is the role of satellites in understanding climate change. and and sort of put the role of satellites into a broader context. So since you guys are teachers, I feel perfectly comfortable asking that, you know, asking you questions. Um, anybody have any idea what this is? The, the blue is adjusted and the green is not adjusted. But any, any thoughts what this might be? If you look at the dates, the kinds of numbers we're talking about. No. It's a good guess from the shape of the curve, though. It's the Dow Jones Industrial Index. <laughs> and there's, there's a reason I put this up. Okay, when we want to know, sorry, I, I should have I shown you this. When we want to know what the market's doing, what do we do? We look at indices. We look at the Dow. We look at the standards and poor, standard and poor's. Heard a question about sort of people using data for their own purpose. We're using a stock market analogy. You don't look at one stock and say, you see, the market's going up or the market's tanking. You look at a lot of stocks or you look at representative stocks. How many are in the Dow? I think it's 30, 20. I think it's 30. I'm not an investor. I'm a scientist. Um, you look at some representative index. You look at the Standard & Poor's, okay, five, or the S&P 500, 500 stocks to tell you what the market's doing. And you don't look at 1960 to 1975 and say, oh my god, if I extrapolate this out to 2000, I'm going to be owing people money that I don't even have. You, you look at all the time series that you have, all the information you've got, to put that together to tell a story. Okay? Now with climate science, um, this is the temperature record from GIS, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. The NOAA one looks similar, the Hadley one looks similar. Nobody's making this up. They may differ by a couple hundredths of a degree here or there, but the basic character is consistent throughout. Um, and I put this up because time, this shows that time is a critical factor. These are global averages wherever we had thermometers at the time. But you can pick out 10-year time periods. If I had a pointer, I'd, I'd point. But, um, you know, stable 1880s to 1890s, um, early 19th century, certainly the 40s to the 60s. But if you just watch the evolution, I think nobody would argue these are going up. Uh, it's, it's time is a critical variable, as is space. So we're trying to take all the information we have, all the credible information we have. Okay? Beware of anyone who excludes credible information, but don't, don't be too skeptical of people who can give reasons for why they're excluding what they're excluding. Okay? That's a little lesson there. This is, uh, and I'm going somewhere with this. Um, this is similar to what Susan uh, had shown um, sort of that that circular pattern observations theory modeling these are the tools for understanding what's going on in the world how it works observations typically inform theory we see something we want to explain it theory in in a broader integrated sense leads to model development that's sort of the compilation of many theories observations inform model development and it all goes in both directions we learn from models, we learn from theory, we learn from observations. Each informs the other. So I'm going to talk mostly about the observational component, but it 
also touch on its relationship to theory. So there are challenges to observations, okay? These are challenges in time and space. Talk about time first. We've only had the tools to really observe real time what's going on in, well, you saw the temperature curve back to 1880, but the satellite record, which is global and comprehensive, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 in the case of Tyros, depending on the variable you're looking at. But we look at the time record, we, we have proxies that help us figure out what's, what's going on temporally, what, how today matches to the past. We have tree rings, good for a couple thousand years, depending on how old your trees are. We have ice cores, good for a few hundred thousand years, depending on where you drill them. We have geological cores, good for millions of years. Um, and then there are other proxies. So we do the best we can to put today into a historical context based on proxy evidence, okay? evidence from these records that, are, that have been stored over the centuries, millennia, and whatever the equivalent is for millions of years. Um, but now space. The challenge in, space, in, in the spatial challenge is one of context, scale, and perspective. I use this a lot when I talk about remote sensing. Um, first of all, it's obvious these are graduate students doing graduate student work. But, but I say this says, so get ready, guys. You know, put your, get your parkas together. Um, this says a lot about what remote sensing brings to the table. And when I show this to people, they say, yeah, I think I get it. It looks expensive. It looks hard to get to. You know, it looks dangerous. That's all true. But as a scientist, what this says to me is the challenges are those of context, scale, and perspective. How do we turn a measurement like that into something meaningful about the entire globe or the entire Arctic region or the entire Antarctic region? That's a lot of graduate students. It's a big planet, right? Well, one uh, person who was way ahead of his time was Socrates, who first recognized man must rise above the earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. Now, I'd like nothing better than to rise above the atmosphere and go into space, but... Um, it's pretty competitive, and I'm pretty old now by most standards, so I use satellites. Unfortunately, there are many of them that tell us amazing things that actually I wouldn't even be able to observe myself had I been up there. Um, one of these, actually, let me, let me pause this for a second. So I talked about observation theory and modeling, okay? Well, one of the things, this is an example of how this all gets put together. Um, we observe ice melting when sun shines on it. In fact, anyone know how that was first discovered, the, uh, the effects of absorptivity and reflectivity, the, uh, why white is reflective and black is absorptive? Any science teachers know that? It was first demonstrated by Ben Franklin, who went out on a snowy, sunny day, or a sunny day with snow on the ground, laid a black cloth and a white cloth on the ground and watched the black cloth melt in. So there was a theory there. Maybe these absorb energy. Um, and the, it was a hypothesis that was tested, and observations bore out the theory, and we had something pretty robust. Yeah, this does happen. Well, let's take that to a planetary scale, okay? We understand that ice melts when sun shines on it or when it gets warm by other means. Well, ice... I, I, my own expertise is the ice-covered parts of the world, the polar regions. They're particularly sensitive to climate change because they reflect incoming sunlight. Now, if we just look at the observation and relationship, we've observed ice to be shrinking. Our theory tells us that will expose a darker surface underneath that will absorb more energy. Okay? That's observation and theory. So let's watch this. So, Sun shines on ice, ice reflects the energy, it starts to melt, exposing a darker surface below, which absorbs more sunlight, which causes more ice to melt, which exposes more dark surface, and so on. It's a self-compounding effect, what we call a positive feedback mechanism. Well, the observations show the ice shrinking. The theory shows that either we've got more sun coming, or there's something trapping the heat that's causing this ice to melt, or it's melting from underneath. All three plausible hypotheses. 
And the modeling tells us the significance of that in the global climate system okay, and helps us try and figure out maybe what's coming, what, what does our future hold. So we couldn't have these observations, how strong the sun was shining, the reflectivity of the ice surface, how much it's melting, the temperature of the ocean, the temperature of the overlying atmosphere, on the scales that we need without the satellite observations. So we put them together and they tell a remarkable story, not just one of shrinking ice. You, know, you could be in Alaska and realize, hey, ice seems to be moving further away from the shore. What does that tell you about Siberia? Not much. You're left to draw some inferences because it's a very complicated system and it's the complexity of that system that drives the need for global observations. We just think the poles, you know, if you look at the history of climate modeling, the Arctic and Antarctic were just, we'll make them white and we'll make them cold. The real stuff happens in the equatorial regions. Turns out that's not true. They matter. This is uh, evolution of ice throughout the season. In winter it grows, in summer it shrinks, and so on. It just, well, not so on, that's it. It just does that over and over. So if you watch this, winter maximum, summer minimum, this is what we call the perennial ice cover. Okay? The stuff that survives the summer melt. It's thick, it's hardy, it tells us a lot about the state of the Arctic climate system which in turn is very important for the global climate system. Now, something happened in 2007, and I cannot stress enough, don't pay much attention to one year. Now, that's the biggest mistake a lot of people make. So why am I paying attention to 2007? A couple reasons. Sometimes the change in a year is so big that it makes you stand back and say, holy cow, What's going on? We never thought that much ice could disappear that quickly. But more importantly is the trend that I put uh, in the upper left. Okay, that year, 2007, the, the lowest in that record, becomes extra significant when it's overlaid on the backdrop of the decreasing trend. So it's not the year so much as it is the trend, but this year was such a big outlier 29% less sea ice, perennial sea ice, than the previous minimum in 2005 that came before us, before it. 44% right? less ice than the average. You've got to stop back and say, well, what, what's happening here? What are the physics that are driving that? You, you never hold something like this up and say, the end is nigh, you know, but, <laughs> but you look at something like this and say, wow, as most of us did, what is going on here? And, um, it was so anomalous that a 76-year-old hog farmer from Minneapolis and his wife sailed the Northwest Passage, this area right here, right? sort of the holy grail of Arctic navigation, because it really, if that becomes navigable, it cuts down shipping times enormously between Asia and the U.S., the Northeast Passage between Asia and Europe. Um, so he sailed this in 73 days in a boat called the Cloud Nine. I love that, you know, the Cloud Nine. We sailed the Arctic in the Cloud Nine. And people tell me when I say this, I hear on talk radio that this was done in 1905 by Roald Amundsen. Um, that's, that's true, partly. It was done in 1903, four, and five. It took three years. His boat wasn't the Cloud Nine, I can assure you that. They named their boats intrepid endurance and things like that. Um, but it took three years to navigate that ice cover. We are in a changing regime here. You know, this is what, what we like to say is sort of an exclamation point on the statement that the trend is making. Now note that there's some recovery, and that's important. Why did it come back? Can it keep coming back? What are the mechanisms that drive that? Well, without the satellites, one, we wouldn't know what this trend was. And two, we wouldn't understand or have the means to understand that recovery mechanism. And then I throw this in. This is Roald Amundsen kind of peering in from the past, looking, I think, disapprovingly at the good people of the Cloud Nine. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a different time. Uh, this, you may see this from Walt this afternoon or a figure like this. But what this is is the climate models, all those 
not red line, not the red solid line. The climate models uh, used in the IPCC assessment and predictions, sort of the, the, the big eight or the big 16 of climate modeling. Uh, peer reviewed, rigorously tested, these are the ones we trust. Red is the observations of sea ice cover, and what you see is that reality is, seems to be changing more rapidly than uh, theory, so to speak. And this raises an interesting point. Again, often we hear, oh, models can't be trusted, they're wrong, you know, they can say whatever you want them to say. More often than not, models are conservative. They sort of water down some of the physics so as not to amplify things, to not perturb. So my response to that is, if you don't trust models, you should be more worried. You know, the models at least give us a handle on how things work. But every now and then, or very often, observations come along. Thanks to the satellites, we could observe the Arctic ice cover. Well, sorry, I'll move. Uh, observations come along that um, tell us, hey, we got to rethink how we're looking at things. Right? And this was the case here. Raises some questions. Will the loss accelerate, recover, or remain about the same? Well, what was wrong with that picture? Why were the models so far off? Well, it turns out they don't really do a good job of capturing the thickness because we haven't really had the information to determine how thick the ice cover is. Hey, it's, you know, remote sensing, you're in space, you're looking down, you get a 2D representation. But it turns out there are some tools and some clever people that can use those tools to get at the third dimension. And one of those tools is a, a satellite I've worked on a lot called ISAT. And it lays down near-infrared laser footprints. Closest I could come so that you could see it is infrared or I mean red, otherwise I just have to say, trust me, it's there. But um, lays down near-infrared footprints, and by measuring the water height and the amount of ice above the water, the elevation difference, we can estimate the thickness of the ice cover. And what the satellites are telling us is that from the start of the mission in 2003 to this minimum period, 2007, thin ice disappeared, that's obvious. You can see that in the two-dimensional representation. Thick ice got thinner. So we have a thinning, more vulnerable ice pack, more vulnerable to warm water melting from below, warm air melting from above, and winds carrying it to lower latitudes. And that's exactly what happened in 2007. We, from satellites, we can get wind data. I, you know, we get all kinds of stuff. But wind data, ocean temperature, ocean height, ice temperature, uh, air temperature, those kinds of things. We put it together into a story that says, oh, we had the perfect storm. We had winds carrying ice to low latitude, warm air, warm water, and poof, a low ice level. Looking at Antarctica, though, the ice is actually growing just a little bit. A 1% growth compared to a 10% loss in the Arctic. Um, there are reasons for this, which I don't have the time to get into, but I'm happy to, to discuss uh, offline with anyone who wants to. But it's part of the complexity of the Earth system. Why is the Arctic ice growing a little while the Arc or, sorry, Antarctic growing a little while the Arctic is shrinking dramatically? I'm going to move to ice sheets now, and this is a um, sort of a collection of what the satellites are telling us. We're zooming in here. If you've played on Google Earth, you can do this part yourself. What you can't do is what comes next. Okay? This is imagery of the Greenland ice sheet. In particular, the Jakobsavn ice stream, one of the fastest glaciers in the world. These are melt ponds. These are accumulation of melt water in the undulations of the ice sheet surface. So water accumulates here. This area melts, the darker. It flows out this glacier, and with satellites we can track the speed of the glacier. Let me move the hand. And you see the main flow, the longest, era, or the longest lines are fastest, the tributary to the left, and what we call drawdown in the interior. And this is the calving front. All of these observed by satellites. And this calving front was stable between... It started retreating in about 1850, and we don't know that from satellites. We know that from people. But it was stable from about 1950 to 2001, and then in 2001 it began to retreat about a mile a year, thus removing this, this cork, this barrier to flow, 
allowing the ice to flush out faster. So this, the fastest glacier in the world at 7 kilometers a year, doubled its speed to 14 kilometers a year. And as a result, in that five-year period, it lost the equivalent linear distance of the previous 90 years. Now, the response of the ice sheet to that change was those glaciers accelerated. They started flushing their ice out. Eh? And what you're looking at now is the topography of the ice sheet observed from ISAT. And what you see is a bullseye pattern. The ice flushes out. Remember that drawdown? It sort of entrains ice with it, pulls it into its flow, and creates this dimple. The ice slumps. The ice lowers. Turns out it's not just here. It's happening all over the southeast, and it's starting to make its way northward. So the ice is changing. It's losing mass. It's losing it much more rapidly than we thought possible as the air above it warms, but more importantly is the seawater that, that fringes it warms and erodes at these, these barriers to flow, um, which leads to sea level rise. And I put this picture up because I hate it. Um, <laughs> As, as educators, you're interested in, in imparting to students facts, a realistic view of the world, okay? This is what would happen if all of Greenland disappeared and a good chunk of West Antarctic ice sheet. But by the time that happens, I promise you, New York City's not going to look quite like that um, because it happens over centuries. The point is, the truth is sufficiently compelling that I don't think it does anyone any good to exaggerate it to try and grab attention. So don't remember this, remember the X. But I felt compelled to put it there. But it's the little wiggles. Now this is sea level rise. The units are off. This was from JPL. It was actually produced by Steve Neerham here at the University of Colorado. Sea level rise in, that's got to be millimeters. Um, starting in 1993 with the Topex satellite record. And we see little wiggles. The ocean warms, it expands, if it cools a little, it contracts in places. The ice flows in, the ocean goes up. Sometimes the ice slows down, it goes down a bit. But there is a trend here. Okay? And some people will look at this and say, ah, nothing to worry about. We've had three good years. We can all stop worrying. Um, the point is that these little wiggles tell a story, as do the large trend. And by putting together the ice story, the, um, you know, the ice sheet story, I didn't even show Antarctica, the ocean elevation story, this comes from measurements of sea surface height, we start to understand the interplay between all of these components. And then if we get a global picture of elevation change, we start to see the distribution, and it turns out that, you know, if you're sitting here, well, the change isn't that worrisome as compared to being somewhere over here, all right? Well, the only way we get this kind of spatial information consistently referenced to itself is with the satellite data, and they show an ocean rising. And sea level rise is really the sort of undisputable integrator of climate warming. Okay? Things get warm, ice melts, oceans expand, sea level goes up. So it's sort of the final arbiter of what's going on. Um, I just want to turn your attention now from sort of the, the distant uh, ice-covered areas to the more immediate and in your face. Okay? This is a collection of satellite observations of cloud cover, of hurricane tracks, of ocean temperature. I also have one of precipitation, but I'm not showing that here. And the reason I put this, to get, put this up here is because there's another story, the story of weather, but, but weather is, is a, sort of a component of climate, if you will, an instantaneous snapshot. But what you see is hurricane tracks. And with the satellites, we can track the hurricane. Now watch in the wake of these hurricanes. You see Emily the temperature gets a little cool. Okay, you see Franklin, again, the temperature, it's hard for me to see my mouse. I'll just look up here. Um, let's, I'll probably take you up to Katrina. Uh, Harvey, no big deal, far from land, who cares? Irene, but watch the, tra the tail, the wake of the hurricane. And you see the water turn blue. That's the energy that's fueling the hurricane. 
And it's these kinds of relationships that the satellites, watch Katrina, help us understand. You see how red the water was before it came? That's a lot of energy fueling Katrina. Uh, I may as well go up to Rita because that's another good one. So this is the, Ophelia just sort of puttered around. So why do some hurricanes really move? Some are stationary. There's Rita. Why do some collect more energy from the underlying water? These are the things that the satellites are helping us understand. It's not just hurricanes. It's not just ice. It's every aspect of the Earth's system. Now, this is an animation showing the network of Earth-observing satellites by NASA as of a couple of years ago, actually. It's a bit dated. And I put this up because now we go from simply looking. Satellites transformed our understanding by letting us look, letting us watch. We go the next step now to dissecting this, the anatomy of a hurricane. We can zoom in. We can see the cloud bands. We can see the precipitation. Where it is, what you have, those big billowing areas are hot towers, hot air rising up, but intense rain falling from these areas. So we put the story together, and we start to get a very complete picture. One more thing in the global system, and then I'll just about wrap up, is... Whoops. Carbon dioxide, the main culprit of anthropogenic greenhouse warming. Um, we're all familiar with the Mauna Loa record showing the increase in carbon dioxide. What's, what this is overlaying on is the bio, uh, what do I call it? It's, it's the biosphere, but essentially the productivity, the vegetation on land, the phytoplankton in the ocean. And you can see the dance. The more vegetation, the curve starts to go down. As vegetation retreats in the northern hemisphere autumn, the carbon dioxide starts to go up. By putting all of these together into a coherent story, we start to understand how and why the world is changing, and we start to understand the impact of ourselves on the planet. Now, what I want to, um, sort of the next item, and, and I'm just about done, I'm sorry, I'm, this is a talk different than what I usually give. Okay, good, then I'll, well, I won't bore you too long. What I want you to understand is the role of satellites in understanding the fingerprints of greenhouse warming, and to do that, you need to understand what those fingerprints are, okay? If you put heat-trapping gas into the atmosphere, it will trap heat. I can't say it more plainly. People can test that. I don't get it. But that's what it does. Okay? That's like saying if you put shoes on your feet, you will have shoes on your feet. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just how it is. So what do the fingerprints of greenhouse warming look like? Well, the troposphere warms because it's got heat-trapping gas in it, trapping the heat. The tropopause, the boundary between the troposphere, the first 10-ish kilometers of the atmosphere and above, is rising because the troposphere is expanding as it warms. The stratosphere cools because the heat that comes from the Earth's surface isn't making it up here anymore. It's stopping. If you put heat trapping gas in the atmosphere, say it with me, <laughs> it will trap heat. Um, I love teachers. Um, the land warms more than the ocean. Okay, if this is a solar effect, the ocean actually absorbs a lot of energy at the surface. I should say the land surface warms more than the ocean. We have reduction of atmospheric oxygen levels. As more carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere, it interacts, uh, or as more carbon goes in the atmosphere, it interacts with oxygen and reduces the amount of the O2 molecule. Um, warming of all major ocean basins, so it happens everywhere, happens preferentially where the greenhouse gas concentration is greatest. We get amplifications at high latitudes, especially the Arctic. All of these are happening. Okay, from satellites, we can look at ocean temperature. We can look at high latitude temperature. We can look at oxygen in the atmosphere. We can look at carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We can look at land temperatures. We can look at stratospheric temperatures. We can look at wind patterns to see where the energy is moving. We can look at the ocean levels to see where the ocean is expanding. We can look at well over 100 different aspects of the global Earth system. We put them together. We tell a story. We see the fingerprint. Now, I meant, yes, of course, and I'm sorry for not having invited them as I go. You jump in any time. How is the greenhouse 
Well, the Milankovitch cycle is actually evident in this, this figure here. What you see is um, warm, temperature is in red. So the Milankovitch cycle, for those who aren't familiar, there, there are three components of it. The um, eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, the tilt of the Earth's axis, and the wobble of the Earth. All of these change the radiative distribution with respect uh, of the Earth with respect to the Sun. What's different is the geographical component, in part, because the Milankovitch cycle may cool the, the northern hemisphere in some ways, but warm the southern a little bit. Or if the tilt of the Earth changes, the equatorial regions will become warmer and the polar regions will become colder because there's less orientation to the sun. Um, but the main thing is Milankovitch describes the Earth's relationship with the sun. And if this were the sun, and you can say the same thing about sunspots and solar activity, we wouldn't see stratospheric cooling. It would all cool. We wouldn't see preferential cooling at high latitudes because they get the least sun. You know, these kinds of things, there, there are others I could go one by one, but those are kind of the biggest. Right? Thanks for the question. Um, I mentioned uh, the temporal context. This is from the Vostok ice core in Antarctica. And you see uh, temperature goes up quickly, sort of stumbles down, up quickly, staggers its way down, up, down, and so on. Okay. Uh, the carbon dioxide curve is in blue. And, and frankly, um, anybody, who has seen an inconvenient truth? Hey, there, there is something in that that troubled me when I heard it, and Al Gore later got sued for it. Um, but it was, it was he, he, this is correct. There's a correlation between temperature and carbon dioxide, but the cause and effect relationship is not evident in the first part of this curve. Temperature leads CO2. Okay, so the temperature goes up, that releases carbon dioxide, which slows down the cooling. You know, these are a result of Milankovitch cycles, which slows down the cooling. And then temperature goes up, the warming is accelerated by the release of carbon dioxide, and so on. Well, here we are now, today, where CO2 is leading the warming. It's, it's different now. We're in a new place. The old relationships don't really apply anymore. I mean, the physics is still the physics. But we can't quite look to the past as a guide to the future. So what I say is climatologically, we're in unfamiliar territory here. Right? And our success as a society really depends on how well we understand, anticipate, and prepare for the changes that will come. And they will come. Even if you take humans out of the equation, changes will come. Now, we believe, most of the scientific community, that humans are going to exacerbate that or are exacerbating that, but change will come. And this is where, again, the satellites come in. They help us understand how things work and maybe figure out how things will work in the future. There are two approaches to dealing with that. This is one. Sometimes I have something that says, insert your own joke here, because I'm sure you can think of many. but. One is in-situ measurements to the extreme, um, but the other, other, there are political jokes you can make that I won't, I won't go down that path here. Uh, or you can try and observe and understand. Now, I loved this figure uh, until about six months ago um, because, well, it, it allowed me to tell a story. These were the assets that NASA had in space to understand the Earth system. Okay, these are the ones that are past their design life, living on borrowed time. Right. In the last couple months, these two finished. And it's really only a matter of time before we've got lonely OSTM sitting out there by itself. But this, the story's a little better than that. There are launches planned. But if you compare this to what I just showed you so this, got to go backwards. It's a very different story. And I'm going to leave you with one thought. Well, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to fade into questions. But I, I think of the, uh, the Earth as kind of a mosaic of stories. It's a lot of little stories telling one hugely important one. Story of the ice, story of the land, story of the water, story of vegetation, 
story of corals, or whatever story you want to tell. But collectively, it's the story of the Earth. And I think of us as on a journey um, into our future as a planet, as a society, whatever that might be. And there's a quote I love by Roald Amundsen, the, the, the guy you saw looking at the Cloud Nine crowd, um, about his successful traverse to the South Pole. Roald Amundsen was the first person to make it to the South Pole. He was in a race with, um, with Scott, who did make it, but made it late and died on the way back. So any way you look at it, Scott lost that uh, competition. <laughs> Um, but uh, the quote is this, and it's long, but it's worth thinking about. I must say that this is the greatest factor, the way in which the expedition is equipped, the way in which every difficulty is foreseen and precautions taken for meeting or avoiding it. Victory awaits him who has everything in order. Luck, people call it. Defeat is certain for him who has neglected to take the necessary precautions in time. This is called bad luck. I hate to think that we're leaving our future to luck. And this brings me back to why I love talking to you guys and people like you, and that is by elevating the literacy, we get away from relying on luck and move toward relying on understanding, preparation, our wits, our ingenuity.